So now, uh, without uh, uh, further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, um, stop sharing and I'll give the floor to Danielle. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madeleine, also for the invitation for this webinar. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Daniela Dul. I'm a consultant at iQuestion Software. Um, and today I will talk a bit about my career path and um, I'll take you through uh, some of the emerging and new digital innovations uh, in sensory research that we are working on. So first I want to tell you a bit about myself and I'll give you a brief introduction about iQuestion and our research center. Um, after that, there are several topics that I want to uh, discuss. So the first topic is um, how you can run tests so that they're more like uh, the real world. Uh, there are different options to do that. I want to share um, insights about voice-based questionnaires, uh, also about how you can do evaluations via video and would they be better um, compared to open-ended questions. Um, and at the end, I want to show you a new module that we're currently uh, developing. It's called the AI Assistance. Um, so a bit about me. Um, I had always had an interest in nutrition and um, how this influences your health. Um, and therefore, I started with a bachelor's study in nutrition and dietetics. Um, this is an education to become a registered dietitian, uh, for which I graduated in 2011. Um, I really enjoyed this study and found it very interesting, uh, but at that time I felt that I was still a bit too young uh, to already start the, the working life and I wanted to learn more. Um, during this education I did a graduation project at the Wageningen University, which yeah, I discovered that I really like um, doing research. Uh, so therefore I decided to continue uh, in Wageningen with a Master's in Nutrition and Health. Um, so I really like their doing uh, the research, uh, which I found very interesting. Also during these studies, um, I started working um, as a student assistant um, at the nutritional department. Uh, and then after I graduated, um, I stayed working at Wageningen University as a research assistant at several projects uh, within the sensory, uh, sensory science and eating behavior group. Um, then after two years, um, I was thinking how to continue with my career. So I really like doing research um, and these research projects. Um, and also the projects that I worked on, um, I often used iQuestion. And I started to think that it would also be very interesting to be on the other side of research. So instead of doing the research myself, being able to uh, support researchers with their studies. Um, so then I um, was looking if there was a vacancy and uh, coincidentally there was one that I questioned at that time um, to which I applied um, and I started working there uh, in 2015. Um, so I started there um, as a support employee. Um, it was mainly helping clients with their questions uh, about how to use iQuestion for their research. Um, at the time, the support team was still a quite small group. Um, and over time, I grew uh, within iQuestion and got more responsibilities. So I started to, uh, for example, create report templates for our clients so that they can easily analyze their projects. Um, I started to give training. Um, in those years, we also opened a research center, which I will tell you a bit later about. Um, so now I actually also have uh, a really nice combination of doing research myself, but on the other hand, also helping our clients. Um, since the support team in those years has been expanded, um, I'm now also less involved in the help desk, uh, but I do help our first line support in case that they have uh, difficult questions. Um, and I'm now also part of an internal team uh, that works out what kind of development and new features we would like to add to our software. So in that sense, I'm kind of uh, the link between our clients and the development team. So. As you can hear, there are a lot of different things that I work on, and that's also what I really like. Every day is different. Um, we also do a lot of innovation, so that just keeps it uh, very interesting. Uh, just a brief introduction about iQuestion. Um, we're based in the Netherlands. 
um, and we make software for centering consumer research. So our software contains all that you need for this. Um, it includes the tools for panel management, data collection, data analysis, and it's used worldwide uh, by more than 118 uh, companies. And we also call ourselves uh, the secret ingredient uh, behind many consumer goods. So in addition to uh, making software, we also opened our own research center in 2019. Um, here we conduct uh, research to validate and publish uh, new methods and new technologies. Uh, sometimes we also do this together with our customers. And we have various uh, facilities uh, over there in the research center. So for example, we have eight sensory booths. Um, we have a training room. Uh, we have an immersive room, which I will show you uh, later. And we also have new techniques that we can use to uh, test out, such as, for example, eye tracking. And we have our own consumer panel. They're called Blind Getest. Um, and we can use those uh, people to uh, conduct our research with. So the first topic that I uh, would like to discuss with you to talk about um, is how you can move uh, from your research lab, from your sensory lab to the real world. So sensory boots, they're often used uh, to test uh, products, uh, as you know. And these boots, they're always designed uh, to be as neutrally as possible so that there are no um, outside influences. But this environment, of course, does not correspond to how a consumer would experience a meal after they buy the product. So if you really want to know how a consumer will experience the product in real life, uh, there are different ways that you can do that. And for example, you could conduct a test in a real location. So for example, you want to test an ice cream and you go to the beach. Uh, but these are often studies that take a lot of time to set up. They're very expensive. Um, you have little control over what happens. So a solution for this is to use, for example, a virtual reality or an immersive room. Uh, and with those techniques, you can bring someone into a different environment but with the advantages that you can easily switch to a different environment if you want. It's cheaper um, and you can uh, imitate a more realistic environment while you still maintain control over what's happening in that environment. So one of those ways is VR. Um, this technology is often used in the gaming industry um, and there's a lot of development also in VR, uh, also coming from the gaming industry, for example. So it was not originally uh, developed for sensory research, uh, but it's always interesting to look at other areas, other industries, uh, what kind of technology is being developed there and can we actually apply it in our own uh, research? So VR is one of those technologies. So VR, it's an uh, artificial environment that you can experience through your sensory stimuli. And you can immerse someone into a different environment using 360 degrees images or videos. Um, so still a few years ago, it was quite hard to, uh, to get those uh, images or videos or you would need to buy them. But nowadays you can very easily make them yourself uh, by using these kind of devices. These are uh, 360 degrees cameras. So you can just place that camera in the environment um, that you would like to capture a video of, and then you could um, upload that video into your VR glasses so that that would become uh, the environment that people are becoming immersed in. And then you can, of course, also add sounds or you could add smell to even make it more uh, immersed. So the panelists, they can see the questions uh, inside the glasses, inside the virtual environment, and they can answer uh, to those questions using, for example, the VR controller, or they could um, be staring at an answer option for a few uh, seconds. So that's called gazing, uh, or they could answer with their voice. So recently, um, a new study on VR was published uh, by the Ghent University. Uh, to which we also contributed, and I would like to show you the results of this study. So the purpose of this research study was to investigate to what extent a congruent eating environment would influence the perception of a product. 
So there were two uh, VR environments. Uh, you can see them here. There was one um, in a summer context uh, with the beach and here in a winter context, also with uh, the water. So this was as a lake, but there was a lot of snow here so that you would feel that it's winter time. So in these environments, um, the participants, they would taste three products um, and evaluate those products. Um, so those products were uh, a watermelon. Uh, this was congruent with the summer environment. Uh, then we had a chocolate travel, uh, which was congruent with the winter environment and a cracker, uh, which was the neutral product. So in total, 100 uh, participants uh, participated um, and they were shown either the winter or the summer environment. So they got one of them. Um, the test was done using eye question on the Oculus Go headset. Uh, that's the VR glasses. And the panelists had to answer the questions about the expected liking and the actual liking of the product. Uh, but also how well did they think that the product would fit in the specific environment um, and how they experienced the whole VR uh, experience. So here we have the results for the um, expected and the experience liking per product per environment. Um, so let me talk you through it. Um, the capital letters, they indicate if there was a difference between the VR environment. So if there was a difference between summer and winter environment. So for example, if we look at the experience liking, uh, we can see that in the summer environment, the watermelon was rated significantly higher than in the winter environment. While if we look at the chocolate truffle, it was exactly the other way around. It was higher evaluated in the winter environment compared to the summer environment. And for the cracker, there was no difference. The lowercase um, letters, they indicate if there was a difference within an environment, so within the summer environment, which product was liked most. So you can also see here that, for example, uh, in summertime, um, the watermelon was like more than the chocolate truffle and the cracker. Um, and also here for the winter, you can see that the chocolate truffle was like more uh, than the watermelon and the cracker. So we also asked how well does the product fit with the VR environment. Um, also here you can see in the capital letters um, whether there was a difference between the two environments. Um, so you can see here that the uh, watermelon uh, was more congruent, so it fitted better into the, sum into the summer environment compared to the winter environment. Um, and for the chocolate truffle, it was the other way around. Uh, the lowercase letters, they indicate whether there was a difference within the environment. Um, so also you can see here that the watermelon was significantly higher liked or uh, it fitted better into the summer environment uh, compared to the uh, watermelon, uh, sorry, compared to the chocolate truffle and the cracker. Uh, and in the winter environment, it was the other way around. So the chocolate truffle uh, fitted better in this winter context uh, compared to the watermelon and the cracker. So we also asked about their engagement. Um, so we used an engagement questionnaire. Um, it was split by uh, the summer context and the winter context here in the results. So we asked on different dimensions uh, how they felt um, during this VR experience. And from all of these dimensions, uh, a total engagement score is calculated. Um, so the total score, it can be a score between minus 16 and plus 22. And a high score uh, means that um, it can contribute to more reliable results of the research. So it's an important uh, thing to measure. And we see here that there's an average score around nine, and that's also consistent with other VR studies. Um, well, for example, if you um, would do this uh, kind of test in a, a sensory booth, um, and you would um, measure the engagement that people have in a booth, um, previous research 
uh, gave a value of zero. So you can see with that, that VR uh, does really engage people more. So the conclusion of this research was that the overall liking um, is higher when a product is assessed in a concurrent uh, VR environment. And therefore, it's really important that when you're going to set up a VR study, uh, that you actually choose the right environment uh, for your study. It should fit with your test product. Um, there was a high engagement score also of the participants uh, during the experiment. So VR, it's um, not yet perfect, I would say. Uh, it also has its challenges. Um, so in a VR study, um, you need to uh, properly guide your participants and it's often one-on-one -on -one assistance, and that can take some time. Um, one of the reasons that this is necessary is that if you actually want the participant uh, to taste the product, you would need to hand this uh, to them because they cannot see the product yet in the VR environment. Um, but of course, VR continues to be developed um, and keeps on being improved. Um, you could already consider um, like using a tracking device or, and 3D models um, within the environment so that participants can actually see their hands in the product so that they can grab the product themselves. Um, for this, you would need to have VR glasses that have a camera at the front so that they can also film uh, what's in front of the panelists. But these are often complex technologies that require help from IT specialists to develop. Um, but also here, these techniques continue to develop. And uh, for example, those 3D models, um, you could nowadays also uh, generate with AI. Um, so I think in the future, it would become a lot easier to do these kind of things. Now, the challenges that we have in VR with, for example, seeing the products, um, you can avoid those by using an immersive room. So an immersive room, that's a space uh, where you can simulate a different environment, um, for example, by playing a uh, video on the walls, uh, but also decorate that space with certain attributes so that people really feel like that they're in that environment. Uh, so here you can see the immersive room that we have in our research center. Um, so with beamers, we project the video, or it could also be an image on the walls. Um, and here we have created a, a living room environment, but very easily you could also change this room uh, to, for example, a beach environment where you have a different um, projection on the walls and you add different kind of attributes. So this way you could uh, create many different uh, environments without that you actually need to go there. Um, and you can let your panelists do the product evaluation um, in this immersive room. Okay, uh, then I want to move on to the next topic, uh, voice-based questionnaires. So um, voice-based questionnaires, uh, they often use two techniques. These are called text-to-speech. Um, this converts your question text into speech. So what you can do with this is you can simply type your question into your questionnaire, but then uh, when the panelist is gonna participate, the question will be spoken out loud uh, by the device uh, so that the panelist can just hear it and doesn't have to read it. And then you have a second technology that's called speech to text. And that's exactly the other way around. Um, so if a panelist would answer through the microphone with this voice, then um, what's being said will be stored as in the data as text. So why would you use a voice-based questionnaire? Um, of course, talking, it's a more natural form of communication. Um, and an advantage is that your panelists do not have to be able to read or write, for example. So because you answer with your voice, um, you can also use your hands to um, evaluate the product. So for example, you want to test uh, a hand cream or something like that, then they can, uh, you can apply the product on your hands. And well, when you have the cream on your hands, maybe you don't want to uh, start uh, interacting with the tablet to uh, give answers, uh, but then you can just answer with your voice. Uh, so you have your hands free to, um, to interact with the product. 
And if you would compare a voice-based questionnaire with an interview with a real person, then a voice-based questionnaire can reduce the interviewer bias. Um, and a kind of interviewer bias, for example, is that um, people um, would give socially uh, desirable answers uh, when they would talk to an interviewer or they prefer to give a positive answer. Um, yeah, ex instead of um, giving what they really think uh, of, of the product. So in our research center, we conducted the study to see whether these uh, techniques uh, can reduce the interviewer bias. Um, so we had 53 participants um, who participated in two sessions. So in one session, uh, they received a questionnaire with these speech-to-text and text-to-speech techniques. So the computer reads out the questions out loud and the panelist answers with their voice uh, through the microphone. And in the other session, an interview was conducted with a real interviewer. Um, we did it during uh, COVID, so it was an online call uh, through Teams. Um, but the person uh, who was being interviewed could actually see the interviewer uh, through the camera. So there was uh, like a real interaction uh, with the interviewer. Um, the two conditions, uh, the panelists participated in both conditions, but it was randomized who started with which, uh, which, which session. So what we did is we gave uh, the participants two types of Frutella. It's a kind of candy. So we told them uh, that they would receive a normal variant and a new variant. And that new variant also had the health claim on it that it was more healthier. But in reality, uh, both products were exactly the same. Um, so we asked the participants, uh, among other things, for example, about their liking of the product, uh, but we also asked them to indicate which product they prefer. So I'll not show you all the results due to the time, but um, if you're interested, uh, you can always read about it uh, in our publication uh, about this study. Um, but here are the results uh, when we asked them uh, which of the two uh, candies did they prefer the most. So here you can see the results of the interviewer condition. So when they were actually talking to a real person um, and you would expect because they actually received the same product twice. So there was no difference in taste. Um, so if you would ask about the taste, um, then it would be 50-50 uh, in which variant uh, they would prefer the most. Um, so that would be the expected model. Um, however, in the interviewer condition, we saw um, that most people said to the interviewer that they liked the new product uh, better than the regular product. Um, so that could be an interviewer bias where the panelist does not want to disappoint the interviewer and they just say, okay, yeah, I like the new, uh, new variant better. Um, also, the new variant had a health claim. So choosing the new variant was also uh, the socially desirable answer. Then if we look at the results of the speech-to-text and text-to-speech condition, uh, the expected model was again the same. You would expect 50-50. And then if we look at the answers that the panelists gave, so they were talking to the computer, um, you actually see that it, um, it matches with the expected model. So it's about 50-50 that people um, chose for the new product and the regular product. Um, so in this respect, you can see that in, the, in this condition, there's no longer this interview bias here anymore. So also these techniques, um, they continue to develop. Um, and in the future, you could, for example, also look at using um, an avatar that asks the questions instead of um, having a, a real interviewer. Um, or you could have, for example, an AI chatbot um, that leads the questionnaire and that can ask new questions uh, based on the answer that participants gave before. Uh, many people also already have smart devices at home. So you could also integrate these type of questionnaires into, uh, let's say, smart speakers uh, or Google Home devices. Um, so here I have a, a short video with an example of how such an integration could look like. So we have here uh, 
uh, device that would uh, guide the questionnaire. Um, it would speak to the panelists and the panelists can follow the instructions uh, and answer using their voice. So let me just, yeah, the sound is on. Hello, welcome to this guided instruction task. Today we are going to prepare a soup. I will tell you step by step all the instruction. For preparing this soup you will need the following ingredients. 3 zucchini, 2 onion, thyme, 1 garlic, celery and 1 stock cube. As a first step, clean all the vegetables under running cold water. Cut the zucchini and the celery into pieces. Chop the onions and finely chop the garlic. Rise the time. How would you describe the quality of these ingredients? Are they good, okay or bad? Good. Heat the oil in a large pan and fry the onion and garlic for five minutes on a low temperature. Add the pieces of zucchini, celery and thyme and fry for five minutes on medium heat. Continue stirring. Add the water and stock cubes. Bring to the boil and let the soup simmer. Puree the soup with an immersion blender for two minutes. Add the soup in a large bowl. You can also add mint to the soup and let it warm up briefly before serving. Now enjoy the soup. After you have finished the soup, I'm going to ask you to answer some question on the taste of the soup. How much do you like the soup in a scale from one to five? Four. So this is just an idea um, that we have of how this kind of integration uh, could work. Uh, so the panelist is uh, doing performing some tests and the instructions and the questions, they come from the device and they can just answer uh, with their voice while they're performing the task. So another method uh, that's currently being used more often is to let consumers make video recordings of their product evaluations. Um, so last month, we did a small pilot study in our research center to investigate if there is a difference between video comments and written comments. So why did we want to investigate this? Um, the consumer's opinion, of course, determines if they will buy the product. And nowadays, more and more uh, reviews are done uh, via video, uh, especially among the younger generation. Um, in general, I think the younger generation is busy with videos like on TikTok, on Instagram, and for example, less and less into writing. Uh, we also see that more video reviews are being uh, done in online shopping and a video can give a good overview of the product. So we were wondering whether a video review is better than a written review. Um, so some advantages of using video feedback is that videos can provide better insights um, in the emotions and the initial reactions of the participants, uh, but they also provide information about the context of the test environment where are people actually doing this evaluation. You can of course see that on the video. Um, also nonverbal communication can be visible on the video um, and videos can provide more easily um, an extensive product evaluation because people can just uh, keep on talking. Um, and videos are being used more and more in social media, so people also get more used to, uh, to create videos. On the other hand, um, written feedback also has some advantages. Uh, so, for example, maybe people can make uh, their description more clearly and more precisely than in a video because they just have a, a limited number um, of space that they can add their uh, information in. And someone might also take more time to think about the answer when they need to write it down. Um, so writing can be faster than recording a video. Um, and of course, the data is easier to analyze and to share because you just have the text uh, in a data set. So what did we want to do? Our first goal uh, was to see if there's a difference in the quantity of words uh, used in a video or in a written review. So we had in total uh, 46 participants who we divided into a written group and a video group. Uh, both groups uh, were given the same questionnaire, but one group was asked to answer by typing the answer and the other group had to make a video recording of their answer. So as you can see, we had a bit more people in the written group. 
um, and that's because during a screener we asked uh, whether they uh, would feel comfortable in making a video recording and not everyone wants to participate in this um, so we included those people in the written group Uh, it was a home use test, uh, so the participants came to our research facility to pick up a bag um, and that contained two chocolate cookies. Uh, they had to judge both cookies, but each on a separate day and the order uh, was randomized. So they were first asked to rate uh, the packaging and then they had to taste the product and uh, rate the taste. So this is what the questionnaire looked like uh, approximately. Uh, so the questionnaire um, could only be completed on a mobile phone so that it would be a better comparison uh, with the video that also had to be recorded on a mobile phone. So you can see here um, where the people could enter their uh, written comments and here uh, they could simply click the button and record a video and upload that into the questionnaire. So video analysis can be very difficult if you have to watch the videos one by one and you need to make a transcript. Uh, but fortunately now with AI, uh, that's provided tools that can automate this. So we, um, I'll show you later how we've done that. Uh, but based on the video analysis, we determined from, uh, from the videos how many words were used by the participants. And we did the same for the written comments. And then we tested if there was a significant difference between the number of words used in both groups. Uh, we did that uh, with the Welch two sample t-test. So for this video analysis, um, as I said, it's often very time consuming, but we're currently implementing um, I question AI assistance that can help you to analyze this video analysis. So the first step is that you um, have your uh, bulk of videos and you upload them in one go into the system. So then in the first step after you've uploaded um, uh, your videos, a transcription is made for each video. So you can see here the progress um, and once all of the videos are transcribed, you can uh, view that for each video if you would like. Um, if you want, you can also edit uh, the, the text that were uh, said if you need to uh, correct it. But you can see here exactly at which time point in the video what was being said. And you can at the same time also see uh, what was happening in the video at that moment. So all of this text you can then export um, so that you would have a, a document that shows the spoken text, uh, including the time points uh, when it was said. So instead of uh, listening to all of the videos one by one, you can now let the AI uh, do this for you. So we asked the panelists uh, about the packaging and the taste. Um, and as you can see here, so you see here the results of the packaging evaluation um, and here the results of the taste evaluation. And for both, um, the video group gave a lot of more words um, in their evaluation compared to the written group. Um, so it was more extensive, um, but it was also because people were going to describe what they were going to do. Uh, so in the video, they were, for example, saying, okay, I'm now going to assess the packaging of this chocolate cookie. While when you are going to type this, you're not going to do that. So that's also one of the reasons uh, that there were a bit more words. So we also asked how comfortable or how relaxed they found the questionnaire. Um, we saw that the written uh, questionnaire was found slightly more comfortable and relaxing. Um, and we think that's partly due to the age group that we had. Um, so we had an average age of uh, 50 years in our group uh, of participants. And we think that maybe they were not as used to making video recordings as the younger generation. Um, and maybe therefore they also um, felt it more comfortable uh, to write uh, their comments down. So it would also be interesting to do this research again with the younger generation. 
uh, to see if their level of comfort uh, would be uh, different uh, in that age group. So we learned from the video, uh, we learned that the video feedback resulted in more words. Uh, but then, of course, the question is, does it also give more information? And is the quality uh, of video reviews better than written comments? So with AI, um, we made a summary of all the packaging and flavor comments uh, for the video and the written comments. Um, and what we want to do next is we want to do a team analysis on these summaries. So the idea is to see if there's a difference between the teams described in the video or the written comments. Um, as we just recently performed this study, we're still working uh, on this team analysis, but I just wanted to uh, share with you what our idea for this is. Um, so the idea is that we use a text highlighted question type where uh, we ask a number of people to uh, select the text that belongs to a specific team. So this is, for example, um, a summary of all the uh, answers that people gave uh, made by AI. Um, and then we want to see if there's a difference in the number of teams mentioned between the video and the written comments um, so that we can see if maybe um, the video uh, comments are more detailed uh, than the written comments. So a brief uh, conclusion of the research that we have so far. Um, for video recordings, uh, we notice you do need to give your panelists more instructions just to make sure uh, that you get good videos uh, that you can actually use. Um, and the panelists might also be a bit technical, at least should know how you can record videos on the phone. Um, and the screener that we, uh, with, that we had before the actual research, it showed that uh, written comments were preferred by a large group of participants, um, maybe due to the age group, but I think it's also interesting to, um, to look at, for example, audio feedback instead of video feedback. Uh, because audio feedback is slightly less privacy sensitive because you don't have to make a recording um, with visuals. Um, on the other hand, the video does provide more insights about the participants, um, but it's something that we could, uh, could investigate. And the AI um, is getting uh, better and better, uh, but you cannot use it yet completely autonomous. So it's important uh, to keep on training the AI properly. So we're working on adding AI as a module to iQuestion, and I want to show you some of the developments that we're working on. Um, so for example, what you can use AI very well for is to analyze qualitative data. Um, so currently in our tool, uh, we already have the option that you can manually label comments. So for example, here, you can see all of the comments that panelists gave, and what you can do is you can um, search for certain uh, words in that response um, and then give those words uh, or those remarks a label so that later on you can do easier analysis on it and you can get statistics like okay, how many uh, people gave a bad uh, remark or were, uh, gave a good remark. So this is still a manual task. However, you can also let this uh, be done by AI. So what we're working on is that you can um, let AI analyze all of the words. So here it's just a very simple example um, where we have different uh, comments here um, and the AI uh, would rate them, um, would give them a label. So this is uh, the peanut butter chocolate sweetness hits the right notes. It's a comment about sweet. But what this also uh, can do is it can, uh, can let you know what the sentiment is. So is this a positive or negative comment? Because the sweetness, it can be positive. In this case, they say it hits the right note, so it's good. On the other hand, it can also be overpowering. And here you can see it's sweet, but it colored red. So that means that uh, it was actually negative. 
Um, and based on that, you could also create these kind of graphs where you can in one side see if, um, yeah, what kind of comments were given and were these good or bad uh, uh, comments. So in addition, AI could also create a summary of all of the comments that were given. So for each uh, product that's being evaluated, all of the comments can be uh, summarized by the AI so that in one uh, overview, you can see uh, a summary of uh, how the product was evaluated by your panelists. Now we're also working on uh, eye tracking glasses. Um, these are glasses that uh, you can take easily with you. They also have a long battery life. Uh, so for example, you could use this for marketing research uh, or product research. Um, and through these glasses, you can track what someone is looking at. So these glasses, they have a camera at the front. That camera would uh, capture uh, the environment uh, that someone is in. And there's also a camera uh, on the inside. And that one is um, filming the eye um, and using AI, uh, it can detect the pupil and therefore um, it can detect where someone is looking at. And then as outputs, you can, for example, get heat maps or gaze plots. So the first step is um, here, you, you need to calibrate uh, the glasses so that it uh, can detect um, the pupil well. And then you can, for example, see here in this video, uh, some output. So you can see in which order are people looking at the different items. So here we try to mimic a kind of supermarket shelf. You can also see here in the corner um, how the pupil is being tracked. Uh, but what you can also do is, for example, create these uh, heat plots where uh, the more warmer colors indicate what was looked at the most. Now, the last thing that I want to show you um, is the AI witness. Um, this is a lamp equipped with a camera. Um, and audio recording is also included. And you can use this very well to investigate uh, behavior in a social context. So the idea is that you can place this lamp on a table and just observe what's happening. Um, and because it's not so invasive, we uh, hope that the panelists uh, will forget that they're being uh, recorded. And that way you have a natural uh, situation at the dining table. So the audio and the video images, um, you can link them. So then you can use that later for your data analysis. Um, here's an image of our first prototype. Um, so you can see here uh, the cameras here at the top, uh, but we also have a camera here at the bottom uh, so that you can get a good overview uh, of the entire table. So you can see here a setting uh, where there's a lunch uh, being done. So you could, for example, track in this way, um, yeah, what's happening, uh, when is which product put on the sandwich, things like that. So for the analysis, you can train the AI to recognize certain uh, focus points. So for example, um, you can train the AI uh, on this chocolate sprinkles or the uh, chocolate spread. Um, and based on that, you can determine how often uh, there's an interaction with this product. Um, since it's also recording the audio, you can also uh, track back what was being said and you can go back into the video to see what happens uh, at that moment in the video. So we are still developing uh, the prototype. Um, this is the second version of the lamp, which already looks a little bit different and is more robust. Uh, so you would have here uh, the camera at the top. Um, and in here, we also did a, a small experiment uh, in our immersive room uh, with some crips. So what you can see here um, are that we are able to track the hands and the product. So you can basically see in the graph here below uh, the moment that there was an interaction with the product. So then you have the more uh, wider bar. So you can see here that someone uh, was scrapping uh, the crisps. So in addition, um, 
yeah, what I said, you can also analyze what was being said. Um, but you can now also search within uh, the whole video about certain words or certain um, items that you're interested in. So for example, um, one of these were a normal crisp, one of these were a crisp made of shrimps. So if you want to know if something was said about seafood, um, you can um, let the AI search for that within the transcript. So you could run a query on seafood. Um, but the AI is even smart enough that it's not just looking for exactly seafood, um, but it would also know that, for example, a shrimp is a seafood. So it would also show you the comments uh, that were said about shrimps. Um, so I think uh, the AI has a lot of potential and in the end could save us a lot of time uh, with analyzing these kind of data. Um, and this is what I wanted to, uh, to show you today. So I want to thank you all for joining. Um, and if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Danielle. It was a very, very interesting uh, presentation uh, and uh, I hope has been very inspiring for uh, everyone in the audience. Um, of course, uh, uh, yeah, if any of the participants has uh, a question, feel free to type it in the chat or open your mic and you can freely ask your question uh, uh, to Danielle. Um, I actually have in for start our question um i um, was uh, a little bit curious uh, about your background so you uh, indeed started with nutrition and now uh, you're doing something that uh, perhaps is very different compared to what you started mm -hmm. uh, can you still sometimes find a linkage between like new technologies uh, and uh, uh, nutrition and health or um yeah is there still some time of way that you can apply this kind of technology in the nutrition and health the kind of sensory field yeah uh that's a good question of course part of sensory science is product development for new products uh which can of course also be uh making the product more healthier uh, so you can think of methods uh, how you can uh, include less salt in products to make it more healthy but also for example this lamp um, it can very well be used to do like really behavioral studies um, to see how could you um, uh, make sure that people are uh, being nudged into more healthier behaviors. Um, for example, with this, you could easily uh, count how often do people, if you give them uh, multiple options on the table, do you have some unhealthy and healthy products there? How can you nudge people to go to the, the healthy product um, and with these technologies you can also do that stuff uh, yeah so i think there's still a, a link sometimes yeah oh, super nice to hear um and then i had a question uh, um perhaps uh, maybe you can share an advice uh, if uh, someone in, in the, our audience uh, still needs to define their career path and perhaps has been inspired by your presentation and would like to um, do research using this kind of technology or uh, start uh, to investigate what new technologies could be used for sensory science. Uh, do you have any um, any knowledge that uh, you feel are uh, must have for uh, developing this kind of uh, um, tools or a background for sensory and consumer science is still enough for uh, uh, making this a project concrete? Um, yeah, I think having uh, yeah ideas about yeah research and uh, you need to be of course uh, to do these kind of things that innovative, um, think uh, out of the box because these are stuff that uh, yeah that that are not there yet. Um, I would also say that it's interesting to look like what I said to other industries if you can get ideas from there uh, if they can be. Because there are a lot of industries where a lot of things are being developed, um, which could be very interesting uh, to also apply into the sensory research. So I think it's also good to keep an eye on those kind of things um, and see, oh, is, there's this new technology there. Can we actually apply it in our own field as well? And in what way could we do that? Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and uh, if there are not 
any other question from the audience? Uh, I'd like to indeed thank you, Danielle, for uh, joining. It was uh, such an inspiring uh, uh, talk. Um, and uh, I'm going to just quickly share my screen as I have a few announcements that I have to uh, do. Uh, maybe, yes, so let me. Okay. Um, so um, I wanted to just mention a few events that uh, we're going to have uh, uh, soon for uh, organized by the E3S uh, uh, group. Um, in May, we're going to have our uh, E3S annual symposium. So if you are part uh, of the working group, next generation working group, you will find us there. Uh, and we're going definitely to organize a, a gathering. Uh, still, if you want to be part of the group and you want to meet us, that's definitely a good event where you can meet us uh, in person. Uh, we are also, of course, to be at the Eurosense uh, um, in uh, Dublin this year. Uh, and uh, again, we're going to organize a gathering there, uh, along as uh, organizing three uh, sessions for the early career uh, researcher. So if you are planning to submit uh, an abstract for Eurosense uh, and uh, um, you are still an early career researcher, make sure indeed that you tick uh, uh, the box mark that uh, you want to uh, be included uh, in the early career um, researcher um, um, uh, group. Um, this uh, was uh, the first of the uh, webinar series that we're planning to do this year. Uh, and uh, what uh, we're going to do uh, is planning another one for uh, May. So uh, we're going to share again the event uh, in our social uh, network. So you're free uh, to join our uh, next event. Uh, we wanted also to sponsor that, that there is uh, um, in May an upcoming uh, uh, course organized uh, uh, by the IEPAS Association, so the Sensory Society for Spain, uh, which is organizing the uh, second international workshop uh, on the sensometrics. Uh, in case you are interested uh, in uh, joining, you can find all the information in the following website. Um, and finally, uh, yeah, a little bit of promotion of our group. If you're an early career researcher and uh, uh, or worker and uh, you want to join as a member in our group, um, uh, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, we do not only organize uh, uh, indeed the webinar uh, like this, but we mostly also uh, do event and uh, activity to uh, network. Uh, so if you're just curious to learn a little bit more, uh, you can find us uh, um, in the E3S uh, uh, website. So uh, this is the uh, E3 website that I'm going to share in the chat. And once you go uh, in the website, you can find us by going to the working group and then uh, click on the next generation. And in here, uh, you can learn a little bit more about our group, uh, uh, see what uh, the activity uh, we do. And if you, you want to join us, then uh, you're free to uh, fill this uh, Google form. If you're part of a sensory society, a nation sensory society, then you are automatically uh, uh, part, part of our group as well. It doesn't require any fee. Uh, and uh, uh, indeed, we welcome uh, everyone to uh, join. Um, so, uh, I think, let me just quickly double check the chat. Um, I think, uh, um, a lot of people uh, are very impressed by the presentation. So thank you again, Danielle. And, uh, um, thank you all for joining this, uh, first, uh, webinar series. <laughs>